Welcome to everyone. Morgan is um, going to be managing this for us, and at some point she's going to do Facebook Live, but first we're going to show a little bit of the video. So I have it on my computer, and um, as with everything, I'm new at this, so forgive me if I make errors with the technology. <laughs> but um, I'm going to try to share my screen right now and show just about a little bit less than five minutes of the video. So here we are. This watch is, the video later. Does everyone see this now? Yes. Okay, this is the library um, calendar. You go to calendar and this is the page about this event. And I've posted the video here and the website here, uh, Segregated by Design is the name of the website where this is posted. I also put up an interesting conversation um, on C-SPAN if you want to listen to that and hmm. on um, NPR's Fresh Air. So this is where you would find those things. So here is um, the video itself, and we're gonna watch a few minutes of it. So let me get this. I think the whole thing right. is like 17 minutes long. Yeah, it's very short, but we just I just wanted to give you a feel of it yeah. um, so you can see what it's like. <laughs> In the middle of the 20th century, the city of St. Louis, Missouri, and the United States federal government condemned and demolished the neighborhoods in downtown St. Louis where African Americans lived, displacing thousands. They built the Gateway Arch. They built a university, interstate highways, hospitals, and middle-class housing that was unaffordable to the former African American residents. Those who were displaced and relocated to the few other places available, converting inner ring suburbs like Ferguson into new segregated enclaves. We have been led to believe that racial segregation in housing is de facto segregation, by accident or the result of private prejudices. Yes, private prejudice clearly contributed to segregation, but by itself it could not have segregated the country without the intention of the federal government to segregate neighborhoods throughout the nation. If, however, we understand the accurate history, the history that was once well known, but we've all now forgotten, that racially segregated patterns in every metropolitan area like St. Louis were created by de jure segregation, racially explicit policy on the part of federal, state, and local governments designed to segregate metropolitan areas, then we can understand that we have an unconstitutional residential landscape. And if it's unconstitutional, then we have an obligation to remedy it. The federal government and the New Deal of the Roosevelt administration of the 1930s pursued policies in the mid-20th century that segregated metropolitan areas. One important policy was the first civilian public housing program, which frequently demolished integrated neighborhoods in order to create segregated public housing. In the late 1930s, another New Deal program, the United States Housing Authority, was adopted. The very first projects built under the United States Housing Authority authorization were in Austin, Texas, because the most aggressive proponent of public housing at that time was the congressman from Austin, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And Johnson got the United States Housing Authority to put its first projects in Austin, separate projects for whites, for African Americans, and the project for Hispanics. The project for African Americans was placed in a location that the city plan of Austin had designated as a ghetto for African Americans. The United States Housing Authority and the local Austin Housing Authority demolished something called Emancipation Park which was a celebrations location for the abolition of slavery. The design was to move all African Americans in the city of Austin into this community, whether in public housing or in private housing. The city of Austin then began to close schools for African Americans elsewhere in the city and close libraries and other public facilities to force African Americans to move to the east side. Another program that the federal government pursued to enforce segregation was the work of the Federal Housing Administration. FHA, which subsidized the development of suburbs like Levittown, New York, on condition that they only be sold to white families and that the homes in those suburbs had deeds that prohibited resale to African Americans. The Federal Housing Administration's underwriting manual, 
said that inharmonious racial groups should not be permitted to live in the same communities, meaning that loans to African Americans could not be insured. Government at all levels throughout the nation were involved in promoting and enforcing the restrictive deeds in homes and places like Levittown, and judges enforced the view that these deeds did not violate the Constitution because they were private agreements. Although white middle-class families that moved into suburbs like Levittown could buy property with no down payments if they were veterans and low-interest mortgages, Middle-class African Americans had to make substantial down payments and get uninsured mortgages with higher interest rates. In many, if not most cases, African Americans could not get mortgages at all because the federal government would not insure them. As a result, they bought their homes on contract, like an installment plan where they accumulated no equity and could be evicted from their homes in the event of a single missed payment. Thus, contract buyers did not have the option of leaving a declining neighborhood before their properties were paid for in full. If they did, they would lose everything they'd invested in that property to date. Okay, that gives you a sense of what that... When you're not reading something else. Because the graphics are good. Does someone want to comment? Um, anyway, if you want to see that, you can go to the web page, um, the library calendar, and have a look. It's very well done. Um, I'd like to know what you thought was most surprising about this book. For me, I had no idea. Um, I always had faith in the GI Bill and all of those programs, and I had no idea that they were built in um, with this systemic segregation. Does anyone have any comments? Definitely, I, ne I never knew the story. It was an amazing, amazing book, amazing story. Did everyone get a having chance to read the book? Yeah, having grown yeah. up in uh, the Detroit area, I definitely, um, looking back, and since I'm in my late 70s, so definitely stuff was going on. Um, I can think of the lines that were invisible that I now know were there for housing, but I too had absolutely no idea that the GI Bill um, didn't really underwrite African Americans going to school or that the housing money was not available. I mean, I just was, I was floored. I had no idea the government was involved in this. I thought it was all personal. So they uh, really sold us on this idea was de facto and um, what he's really documented and I think he did a brilliant job of documentation is the fact that it is not de facto. Well, I, th I think it's unusual that um, you would be doing this now. The book came out I think in 2007 and that's when I read it and, um, and then it just kind of disappeared. So I was wondering how you, uh, how you found it. Well, actually, the League of Women Voters found it. Can you tell us that story, Ted? Okay. <laughs> oh, we actually okay. did this book discussion last year, I believe, in March. Um, I like to think the League is kind of ahead of its time. So uh, we, um, this was an issue of segregation and Black Lives Matter, the whole thing. We were already looking into this as, as one of our issues last year, and I believe it was March of 2019 that we looked at it, and I had come across this book uh, and decided to do a book discussion on it then. Um, and uh, Laura contacted me recently with all the, the uh, protests and so on to say, you know, maybe we should talk about it again, because I, I remember thinking when all of this started happening with George Floyd, um, I, I, it took me back to this is where it all began and it is I I found the book Laura you asked what we thought the whole book was just so jaw-dropping to me at how uh just up front and blunt it was that yep we're just gonna do this segregated and and how and I said to my husband explained to me it really explained to me why um people of color are trapped particularly black, are trapped in poverty now. They never had the chance to start 
building equity and they were they were pushed out so yeah and the book evicted we did the book evicted by Matt, uh, yes. matthew desmond which mm -hmm. um was set in milwaukee and <clears throat> in that book excuse me <clears throat> this happens um in that book he really lets you see how those people are trapped and I didn't understand that it was all on purpose, you know, that had been laid, the groundwork had been laid way back mm -hmm. in this, this kind of situation that um, the two books together are really amazing. Yeah. yeah. A few years ago, the UU uh, Fellowship up north got a series of three or four um, videos about racial issues and it is really an in-depth look. We showed it at Hope Church here in town um, maybe three years ago. We had Tracy Robertson come up and give a little talk about um, some of these issues. So it's, it's been circulating around town. It's really gotten interest right now. I, I haven't grown up in Chicago, just referred to as the one of, if not the most segregated cities in the country. I can attest to the accuracy of some of, of, of the statements he made referencing our uh, former mayor and public housing and so on. So it, it just made the learning, I didn't realize it was so prevalent outside of Chicago. Uh, the East Coast, the North, uh, West Coast, it was just, as you said, jaw dropping for me. I, I read some of Mr. Coates' work um, most recently, the eight years of power, eight years in power, and his coming out of Baltimore and the East Coast issues. I, I had a, a different sense, but to, to put it in the, the scope that Rothstein did was, was stunning. It was, it made me feel like the country that I'm living in is not what I thought it was. It was that stunning to me. Yeah. Anyone else live in any big cities? What part of Chicago did you live in? Um, the south side. The south side? The south side of Chicago, yes. We are still Cubs fans, but... Uh, <laughs> Yes, I grew up on the, the south side of Chicago. I, I went to school on the west side of Chicago. Um, mm -hmm. I know about the project. So you were right downtown, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a west suburb, and I just remember um, so much going on with the mayor there. Jane, what was her name? Jane Byrne. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was always, she lived in the in the projects for a while, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, she, she thought she she could fix things by moving into Cabrini for a week. Yeah. Cabrini housing. But now it just seems so systematic. Anyone else have any experiences in any big urban areas? L Laura, I, I had an experience in a small area. I was in Biloxi, Mississippi in, in uh, for about a six to eight month period in, in the late 1960s. And it was as if the Civil Rights Bill had never been passed and the Voting Rights Act had never been passed. It was the, the, the divide between white and black was, was so visible. And com coming from Green Bay, Wisconsin and ending up in Biloxi, Mississippi was really quite interesting transition it was it was i can't to this day i can't even find find the words to uh, describe what what it felt like down there i i still can't find them but it was it, it, it was an experience i will will never ever forget i had never run across a situation in my life where there were almost a recognition that black folks aren't quite as human as white folks. Mm -hmm. it, 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 and I still can't find the word to describe that. 
but it, it was eye eye opening experience. And uh, I, you know, I, I I was familiar with the famous uh, Supreme Court ruling, uh, where separate but equal. It was still separate but equal down there in 1969. A last, just one last word. Uh, that was the same year that Sesame Street made its debut. Mm -hmm. There was a massive, a massive effort in Mississippi. This is our country now. A massive effort to get Sesame Street off the public airways because, of course, there were white kids and black kids inter interacting. That wall between the two races was knocked down in Sesame Street. And in 1969, Mississippi, they could not handle it. They had just gotten rid of their whites only drinking fountains, you know, a few years before. And uh, that, that was, that was a small city ex experience. Mm -hmm. There were still, I think prior to that, not much, there were still lynchings going on in the 60s in Mississippi. I'm, I'm guessing, I, can't, I, I don't have the exact facts on that. But that's not very long ago. You know, I was, I was in, my, in my 20s at the time. And with the recent developments, it seems like things have not really changed. I grew up, yeah, you know, I was a little bit younger and grew up thinking everything was improving. <laughs> and all of a sudden I read this book and I saw it. It's, we're in the recent um, riots or the um, demonstrations. I, I don't know, what do we call them? In, um, protests. Protests, okay. yeah. Okay. I mean, I was really impressed by the the fact that the country really seems to be upset about this and may, you know, finally getting out in the streets and protesting um, because it's so much swept under the carpet, isn't it? Has been, which is what the book is all about, really. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the other um, thing that we see going on right now, the lost cause, that whole myth of um, you know, the way the Civil War ended and the statues. <laughs> There's so much change going on right now. Um, what does everyone think about that? Here we are in Little Door County, which is um, not very integrated. I mean, not we have very, I think the census tells us we have 96 or more percent white population. Right. Yeah, I just looked that up this morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is it then? Is it? It's 96.2 or something like that. And, and then that's divide, the, the other four approximately percent is divided up between Hispanic, Black. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, this was as of 10 years ago, it would have been the last census. And yeah. I'm, I'll be interested to find out how that's changed now. So if I could offer a synchronicity of timing. I happened to be visiting my daughter last month, uh, actually at the end of May, in DC. I was there for Memorial Day weekend. And I had also started reading this book while I was in DC, uh, while looking for some crab meat. Um, we found ourselves in where we tried to get to the wharf, the DC wharf, and it was, it was blocked. The traffic was blocked to that area. Long story short, we ended up at Lafayette and uh, found ourselves in the midst of the protest. And my daughter, of course, had to jump out of the car. And, um, there, there was a few hundred people on um, Pennsylvania uh, at the time, but to be there then and read this book, just said this this explains this is what has happened in the last century it's, it has not stopped it but it explains why we're here today why we are where we are uh, whether it's in dc or chicago or minneapolis or baltimore it's why we are there the tensions the violence it's it's i mean it's stunning to me 
but it's also hopeful in that the group protesting was multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-generational. It was, and it, it grew. My daughter, of course, continued to attend as I came home, um, as the crowds grew larger. The hopefulness is that it's a movement that appears to have taken on some uh, speed. Yes. I uh, hear a lot of talk about elsewhere. And meanwhile, a few decades ago, I owned a nightclub in a small town and started bringing in black entertainers. And I took posters around back then because that's how you got the word out about your entertainment. Could and you tell us what year that is, Steve? About? about 86, 85 in the uh -huh. 80s. And I took posters around to promote the events. And I was literally shocked at the number of people in my community who would not put those posters up because they occasionally had black people's faces. Wow. And that town was Fish Creek. Mm. And that club was called the Omnibus. Well, I had a reference question not too long ago about um, an article in the local newspaper where a black mother and her kids had moved here. Um, and I don't know, I can't remember. I was trying to track it down and I just couldn't find it, but 80s or 90s, and they mm -hmm. had um, crosses burned on burned their, in their yard. I recall that event, Laura. Yeah. Yeah, I was tried to find the article again, but um, that's right here in Sturgeon Bay. Early 90s. It was uh, early 90s. Yeah. There you yeah. go. So not all that long ago. All right. Yeah. Well, here's a story well, from. Uh, <laughs> When I, when I was about 10, 12 years old, I, I grew up in Green Bay. And um, at that time, the, the, the group that was most discriminated against in a, a, any way imaginable were the Native Americans, uh, specifically the Oneidas. But there, there, there were two African Americans in, in town. The, what they called the Reformatory then, now, now the Correctional Institute, hired a guard who was African-American. And the, so the, the, the fellow came to Green Bay. He could not find one landlord, not one, who would rent to him. You want to talk about a, a, a redlining? It's a different type of redlining. You know, usually redlining done, does with mortgages. He could not find one landlord to rent to him. I, the elder at our Methodist church got in some trouble, but he said, this is, this is unacceptable. The elder went and rented under his name mm. a place for, 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 for the African-American. And uh, that's how the fellow got in, into rental property, sort of snuck in, in the back door. That's in my lifetime. That's Green Bay, Wisconsin, 1957-1958, right around in, the, in that period. I was shocked when I started working as the birth to three educator for Door County. And that... Um, black family was in our program. So I went to Green Bay shopping for dolls of color <laughs> and could not find one anywhere. And I couldn't believe it because just think about all those Packer players whose families were with them in Green Bay. I couldn't understand how there could be no dolls of color at Toys R Us or Shopco or, you know, all those places. And they were even hard to find in catalogs. Yeah. Of course, for the Green Bay Packers who would come to town and, and uh, one of, the, one of their, their first obstacles to overcome is where do they get their hair cut? 
Ooh, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound, you know, we know what it feels, at least I know what it feels like not to be able to get an haircut with COVID. So there you are in Green Bay, and you can't find a place to get an haircut. Uh, oh, go ahead, Ann. Um, I was just going to say that in, in linking together a couple of the nation's crises, I think about how housing impacts um, susceptibility to the COVID-19 disease, that population density and where people live and how many people live in a household has such an impact on the transmission of the virus and how people of color are often just really in a difficult, difficult situation regarding that. I think that's true. Well, contributing to that is accessing healthcare. And in segregated communities, the, the access to healthcare is limited. Individuals have to travel. Um, timing of appointments. Uh, there was a book written in the 90s, a um, woman who spent some time in North Lawndale, Chicago, with a family um, who happened to be receiving care or trying to at the hospital I work. It's called Mama Be Better Off Dead. It's written by a sociologist turned journalist. Um, the technology freezes now and then. Yep, I think she's frozen. Yeah. Kathy, you got frozen. <laughs> With her diabetes. Hey, Kathy, can you, Kathy, back up about two sentences because you froze up and, and we didn't get to hear what you were saying. Two sentences, okay. So the, the matriarch of the family had diabetes. She could only get appointments during the day. The, the driver of the household worked. So she, in order to get her insulin, she would go hyperglycemic, call an ambulance. The ambulance would bring her to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. The emergency room would give her the prescription, chastise her for not keeping her appointment and then schedule another appointment for during the day when she couldn't get there. So as an example of uh, access to healthcare and how now, um, while it's been known that uh, life expectancies in the African-American community are, are shorter, COVID has, uh, has just popped that off the chart by condensing it in a relatively short period of time um, because of the comorbid uh, conditions that individuals are living with make them more vulnerable to the virus. So that the housing segregation that's contributed to healthcare access, that's contributed to uh, varied education access, um, where do we go from here? I wanna point out there's um, a little bit in the chat for those of you who don't have it open. Um, uh, Stephen Kastner has posted a couple of a link. He has posted a link for us from PBS and then also said something about survival by zip code tells the story of um, a 1995 Chicago heat wave, the most traumatic in US history in which 739 citizens died over in a single week, most of them poor elderly African-American. Cooked is the story about life. I guess, is that a movie, a book called Cooked? The PBS um, film. A film, okay, yeah. Powerful. Yeah. The Survival by zip code. Story. Yeah, the link is there to the film. And then also there's a note about Kerry uh, Kovarik, Kovarik, who's here without his um, camera on. And he, if anyone would like to share views after this meeting for a story he's working on for Door County Daily News, please call him. And if you want the number, it's in the chat. So those are two side things. 
sorry for interrupting. I was in Chicago in the in the ninety five in the nineteen ninety five and I remember that terrible heat wave. And I think the virus is showing us the same story again because the news keeps telling us that um, poor and African Americans are by far being hit the hardest. It's the same thing over and over. And people in prison. Prisons. Prison. Well, any you know nursing homes and enclosed environments. So we keep hearing about reparations. What is some, what can we do at this situation, in this, for this situation? What can we do to make a difference in the world? It seems like people are waking up because the um, protests are showing that people are aware and they keep telling us on the news that the majority of people support the protesters. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what um, I've heard on the news. But what can we actually do to make a difference? It looks like the Supreme Court, from what I, you know, um, Richard Rothstein tells us, um, came down on the side of saying everything was de facto, which means that there's no recourse, legal recourse, if it were de jury, as um, he says in the book, um, then you could take more legal action. But that seems to be the big sticking point. Does anyone have any ideas about what we can do about this situation? Well, education is always like the check. topmost thing, I think. Uh, how, how this is accomplished, of course, is uh, through the schools. <laughs> and now we have the problem of no schools. But uh, I, like I said, I couldn't believe that this book surfaced again. It's, it's one of those books you never forget. I read it so long ago, and it's just one you just never forget. So, um, uh, and I think I read it for a, a class. But um, why, you know, why, uh, why is it? now getting a lot more publicity i think it should and that would possibly help as far as uh, being people being educated well that's exactly why we're doing this mm -hmm. yeah that's great i i, I was yeah. very excited <laughs> and um, um one idea that's that's taking place elsewhere in the country I've heard of is if people have own property, own rental property, or own vacation homes or cottages, things like that, to make those available on a short term basis for activists who want a respite, want a, a place to go and come and rest and recharge their batteries. That I think. Uh, the the kind of population density and urban areas and and multi generational households, it, it really can lead to chronic stress. And that if there's anything that um, you know, property owners can do to provide getaways, it, any, anything that would help people deal with chronic stress by having a respite or a retreat, you know, might be some kind of um, idea. Another idea I think I mentioned maybe even uh, last March with this discussion is zoning requirements. Um, Specifically, I'm thinking of the town of Sturgeon Bay. I think some agriculture zoned land property uh, territory, somehow you need to have at least 20 acres in order to build a home. And to me, that seems really restrictive that you have to have a lot of money to own the 20 acres to put up a home. That if you know, changing zoning to allow for more density. Um, I've also lived in many mobile homes in my life. I'm in a condo now, but I've lived in many mobile homes. And so I'm a big proponent of mobile homes, maybe not in Wisconsin, but you know, other climates. And to you know, make it easier for people to, to have housing and not need to own tons of property in order to put up a mobile home or a house. Okay. Go on. It's interesting what you said about vacations and getaways. Uh, years ago, I worked with an organization in Door County called Operation Welcome Homes, a nonprofit that basically um, got people to donate empty rooms in their lodging facilities to house vacation time for Vietnam vets or veterans in general. And we brought a number of vets to Door County uh, for free vacations 
and we got other vendors to actually contribute food and give us all kinds of things. So we brought these vets in, and in many cases, they were down on their luck. They, they were not out of that war with abundant uh, everything. They, they were damaged people, and we were helping them. And uh, there are rooms empty today sitting there, lots of them. Um, it's a it's a possibility. It takes effort though to put something like that together. I know we had. Um, I was fairly young, but um, years ago there was some sort of program that would, you know, it's almost patronizing, but they would bring kids up from inner city Chicago to Door County um, to experience the wilderness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we, I don't know if they do that sort of thing. I didn't think that was so long ago, Laura. <laughs> well, we have films of it. Um, in the 1960s, it would have been, is what oh. I'm thinking. Oh. Yeah. There was another group that brought uh, kids from Northern Ireland to do Ireland, it. yeah. yeah. Uh, getting them out of that war zone and letting them experience what it's like to not hear gunshots mm -hmm. in the background of your life. And maybe now we should be sending uh, people from the inner cities of Chicago to Northern Ireland. <laughs> Just being sarcastic. Has anyone read that book? I can't think, of, it's escaping my mind right now, the young girl who wrote the book about um, a black family in the inner city and oh, what's the name of it? As a teenager and their family's trying to move out of, of that area. There was a movie too. Yeah, and they made a movie out of it. We read it in our multicultural book group. What was the name of that one? Are they, you talking about The Hate You Give? Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I'm trying to think of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one really illustrates a lot of what we're seeing here, where it was very hard for them to move out. And then they weren't even sure, some of them weren't even sure they wanted to move from the family, wanted to move out of the black neighborhood in that situation. So I don't know. Um, Michelle Obama and her um, Becoming book also talks about how her family lived in the inner city Chicago and they saw the white flight happening where people were leaving their neighborhood. And so she talks about it in her book too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that book's been on the bestseller list forever, I think. It's still up there. I think books like that are making a big difference, and that's why we see people reacting um, these days. Someone else was mentioning why is it, oh, Arlen, why is this happening now? I think these video cameras um, that everyone's carrying around are making a big difference as far as some of the protests go, and all of this, um, the fact people are taking films of what's actually happening. In some ways, it's um, you know harder to hide things at least the violence that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And that really shocks people. It's kind of like this book itself has shocked many of us with some of the facts that he's documented here. So it's easy to live in our little little bubble, especially up here. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, there is another book out there. I believe it was published in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and I confess that I did not remember either the name or the author, but um, it was public published, it's written from the uh, other perspective of white privilege and, and defining racism and, and racist and how, you know, so many of us can easily say, well, I'm not because I don't do this without having um, uh, the sense as uh, Rothstein conveys uh, how it, it has become so systemic. Uh, and this author spends a little bit more time with how um, we acknowledge and recognize their white privilege and then um, move to, um, to intervene in active ways. Um, simple, well, not so simple, but if, if you're in a business and you take on in Turn, student interns for uh, a summer program. Um, how often do you go to the, the child of a friend or um, you know, a board member or whatever? But um, now to become more deliberate in 
becoming more diverse in how you and who you select for something like a student internship. That's one, one step. Uh, Coates moves away from reparation. He sees reparation as a, a one step kind of, um, and he moves to the concept of remedy and then needing to look at each of the system structures in place and um, what change can occur in order to move from the from where we're at. And what do you but mean by right. remedy? Um, change that impacts the existing system that becomes more uh, sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, cultural adaptation kind of uh, remedy as an example. Mm -hmm. Uh, like your example of the housing, you know, and, and inviting uh, individuals for respite or um, as an example of a remedy that can become systemic and, and contribute to the, the cultural change, um, which we all need to consider the cultural change. Some th simple things that we could do are to look for and support um, different agencies that are working for um, Black Lives. The All Rise in Green Bay is a growing center. They've had some fundraisers out there. Even just our county here in the county has um, been trying to work towards those goals, uh, even by their little putting books in the little libraries around. Well, one thing that I found very interesting, I had a call from York County Daily News about what books are popular right now. And when I actually um, looked at the databases to see what's being checked out and um, the fact that we were going through the virus situation, a lot of digital books were being checked out, not regular library books. All of the top books were books on um, race. Um, White Fragility was, I think, the title of the one that was checked out the most. And that surprised me because, um, you know, it's usually mysteries and things that are so popular, but people are really interested in learning more. So that, I think, is a very encouraging thing. What I've been sitting here thinking about is, I, I don't know the old, I don't know the answer to my question, but uh, let me sneak let me sneak up on this, trying trying to see how to handle the situation we're in. That's where I'm going with it. In my lifetime, I've seen one sea change in attitudes. It's been, as I see it, monumental, and and that is the LGBTQ movement. Uh, is there, so my question is, if we look at that movement, are there solutions coming out of that movement that could be applied to the uh, divide between white, black, redlining, et, et cetera, et cetera. You see where I'm going with that question? Mm -hmm. Well, I think as a teacher, I, uh, again, I get back to education. The reason the um, uh, other movements, other movements like from um, recycling to the environmental yeah. movements have moved so far forward gets back to children. Children are the ones that advanced many of those movements. And in my, uh, in my classrooms, their attitude toward gay people was at the extreme opposite of what adults' attitudes were. So, um, I, and I think that they are, again, the hope, that there are hope, is that they will um, uh, take, take the torch for uh, the further 
um, education of people in this in this uh, uh, problem also because I just was al always amazed that it was the youth that advanced those other programs. If you look at the history, they they're the ones mm -hmm. that started the started the advance on those programs. So again, back to school, the 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 children must be taught. And again, the the, the uh, what this this year was the last year that the majority of students that graduated from high school were white. So from now on, the majority of graduates are going to be people of color. Mm. So it's not going to be long before something is going to have to happen with, with um, the, that they're voting, they're, they're uh, just becoming adults. It's going to be different. I think you're so right. As a mother and grandmother, I just worry so much about the world we're leaving for the kids. And I don't know if anyone ever reads BBC or Guardian, um, but the headline today is jaw-dropping fact that the population is going to crash in the near future. Um, have a look at that article. <laughs> it's all about how um, in the Western countries like Spain and the United States, the population's going way, way, way down. But in Africa, it's gonna be exploding. And it means that people will be uh, moving all over the place in the future. So it sounds kind of like things are gonna get a lot worse in the future. Here, I think I have the article here if you're interested. Um, I would it's just totally come, amazing. Well, I agree with education being uh, an important component. Um, there's rough, what, is what are our children being taught today about what Ralph seen spoken about? Mm -hmm. is, is, is racism, systemic or otherwise, being spoken about at all? Is our history yes. of redlining um, project well, being yeah. addressed at all? Mm -hmm. The literature I've yeah. seen says it's not. Mm -hmm. So what we can contribute to is attempting to ensure that our, ch our children have access to the information that informs their decision making. Right. We really need to dig into that those different systems and change those laws and change the banking practices and just the whole variety of things. Uh, I don't think just education is going to do it, although it's good. And there have been people that have said, even though our population is not going to have a white majority, because all those laws are in place, including gerrymandering and limiting voting, um, we're going to stay this way for a while until we change those systems. I agree, Sandy. I was thinking as people were commenting, it, it's not just the culture, if you will, and it's not just the systemic things that are in place now, which is what uh, this author put in such high relief. Um, at least we can, something that we can do that's um, uh, positive or some, something to work on, is to work on getting those systemic things that he points out changed. Um, and you, but then you also have to work on the, getting the hearts and minds, as they say. The, the, the cultural shift needs to happen. Um, and part of that is the education system. And it, it's, there are still a bunch of people out there that, you know, I, one of the shocking things to me, and I, I, I hate to be, to sound, uh, <laughs> my husband says I have a uh, Southern bigotry, that when I hear someone speak Southern accent, I think bigot, or <laughs> this, the, new, the truth is, it's everywhere. Um, but there's so many people out there now who are uh, wanting to have uh, evolution 
taken out of the schools. I mean, there are people that just are willfully ignorant or because of, really it's because of religious beliefs in many cases that support this mindset of, uh, and, and then the big fight in the in public schools anyway, is that they don't want this stuff taught. So that's a huge fight in itself just to get the books changed and to get what is being taught changed. Um, or, or not change so much, but as to accurately, accurately reflect what our history really is. Anyway, I think my point being, it needs to be both the systemic change that he talks about and working on the cultural change too, which in some quarters is happening. Which is what's occurred with the LGBTQ. Right. That is that has evolved over over the recent years. And yet we're not totally evolved there either. The trans deaths um, in the last year have just been horrendous. And a point of interest, yes, the younger generation is much more accepting. However, it is the younger generation that is committing these crimes on the large part. Mm -hmm. And that to me is astounding how that is still happening. Well, I think they get all the publicity. Uh, and and the, the, the groups that are uh, working to change all that, they don't get any publicity. Because I see the schools, um, they are moving forward in these kinds of things. And um, uh, again, you, you know, the, it's just like the, the small minority that um, get all the publicity in anything, in, in any of the news stories. So um, I think we do have to have faith in the younger people that they will right a lot of these wrongs. Um, I know I do. Uh, because I, I'm just totally amazed with what um, from what I see, and um, I just don't. Uh, I worry that everybody gets negative instead of positive, and I don't know if anyone else has this feeling that the that things get too negative, and rather than positive thinking, um, I see that you know, especially at this time, people are very negative in their thinking, and. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of a Pollyanna type, so uh, I would naturally look on the positive side, but uh, I don't know if anyone else feels that way. Well, Greta young... says she doesn't want our hope. <laughs> she <laughs> wants us to act now. <laughs> she doesn't want it all resting on her. <laughs> I think that the young people are our hope. Uh, but also, um, they have to vote, and then they have to, beyond voting, they need to run for office. Yes. Uh, in order to make the kinds of changes that are necessary in this country, we need those youthful voices that are devoid of the politics today. And I think the book reflects that, because we have a, some foundations here of how things have transpired in this country and what continues today and if anything um, the systems that are in place uh, the powers that be will just make them more sophisticated um, and make it even more difficult for change unless we get the change in the leadership through the young people in this country I want to read something that's written in the chat and for those who don't see it. Um, Nikki Brydenhagen Howard is listening on um, Facebook and she said she's a co-director of Just Door County. And she writes, one of the things Just Door County is currently fundraising for is to get anti-racist books and books with representation of people of color in, in them. We are passing these books around throughout the county in little free libraries. So far, we have passed out 176 in the past month, um, and that was on Facebook. Has anyone seen any of those little libraries? <laughs> no. Yeah, it's kind of underground great, network. Though. It's great to know. 
but we are getting a lot of books on um, race and this sort of thing in the library also, so be sure to keep an eye on the new books coming. They're on everyone's bestseller list these days. Well, we've been talking about an hour. Does anyone else have anything you want to say? Well, I agree that we all, we live in a bubble up here. You know, if anybody uh, has grown up in Chicago or, or been to Mississippi or lives in um, other parts of the country, the world, other uh, times of the year, um, and you come to Door County and it's, it's just, it is another world. So, uh, if anything small that we can do, like I think that little free little library is a great idea. Um, small things that we can do because so much of the population here, I find, has never been out of Door County. <laughs> the people that were born here, there are so many that have never left. And they stopped their education when they were done with school. Mm -hmm. So if you talk about any of these things, um, I know I, at, at ADRC, when that was open, I would try to sit at a different table every lunch that I was there and talk to people. And I was just like an alien uh, among them. So uh, yeah, just try to, try to get out there and, and um, uh, uh, do, be a positive influence on these people. I think, can I hop in and echo that actually? Yeah. Um, I apologize, I wasn't able Hi. to make it earlier. Um, I had a meeting run late, but I just wanna say that I think one of our um, immense blessings of living in Door County is what a small community is and how accessible these sort of um, like systems that govern the way that we live are. Um, it's very, very easy to get in touch with the police department and meet with them, to email the superintendents of our schools, um, really any level of authority is very accessible for us because our community is so small. Um, and I would, I think one of the, you know, I've heard us speak about education. I think that's very important, especially given how sheltered um, we are as a community. I've spoken to some superintendents in the county and there's um, not really any indication that I've seen that curriculums are going to be modified in order to, um, you know, include more inclusive history or include works by authors of color or to highlight scientists of color. And I think a huge part of that reason is that um, there hasn't been public support for it. You know, our, like as citizens and as, as taxpayers, we are, we have the opportunity to have a say in, you know, how our schools are run, how our police functions. Um, but I think not enough people avail themselves of those opportunities. Um, so I would just encourage everyone in this meeting and everyone listening to um, not just support the work where we see it, but also recognize that there are abundant opportunities if you just send an email or send a, you know, make a phone call to get in touch with people and, you know, voice your um, support and affirmation of different, you know, there's lots of different measures that can be taken to make this a more inclusive and um, educated community for everyone. Thank you, and that, Mikhail, is it Michaela? Yeah. Um, Mikel is going to be doing a um, program with us on Zoom on Friday for anyone who's interested. She's talking, she's working with the Seed Library and she spent some time in Africa um, until recently she had to come back early because of the virus situation in the Peace Corps. Can you tell us a little bit about where you were? Yeah, so I was in Senegal, West Africa, um, and I was working as an urban agriculture extension agent there. Um, so working, I think probably being there is where I learned that um, in a small community, it's easy to talk to like, you know, anyone that you would like to. So, um, I, you know, I was able to work with different groups there to start, start getting some, um, you know, Peace Corps approved agriculture going in there. But, um, you know, they were doing great without my help as well. So <laughs> I feel like I learned more than anything. But um, yeah, so that's that's where I was up until a few months ago. Thank you. Thank you. I would just, uh, I was I just, just thinking. Thank oh, I that, just want to uh, thank Kayla uh, uh, for giving us that idea. There, I, I'm going to call my school board member and ask them, have you ever looked at the curriculum given 
what things are changing now and what we would like to see our children learning. What do those social studies books look like? And, mm -hmm. and you know, what, how do they cover these things? So if enough people call, I mean, that, that in itself, that's a very small step to take to put the idea in somebody's mind to take a look at the books. Bye. Well, I was just going to, to tie it together. I wonder if we could learn from uh, the suffrage movement. No. <laughs> Uh, the okay. women fought long and hard for a while um, and developed strategies in order to move the, their, the priorities forward. You know, maybe we can yeah. learn from the suffrage. And, mm -hmm. and that's a good, good point. We're going to have a suffrage program on the day of the, the um, amendment went through, I think it was um, August 18th. Um, Larry Desitel is going to be doing a really good program on um, how that all happened and focusing on Wisconsin suffrage movement. So I was think I was thinking the same thing, Laura, because the uh, the women's movement has paralleled the black movement. And um, what one book I'm reading for my Texas book club um, are Sisters in Law and the story of Sandra Day O'Connor and mm -hmm. Helen Bader Ginsburg. And I recommend that to everyone because mm -hmm. you can, it just parallels uh, everything about uh, what, the, what women have gone through and now this following on the women's movement. Uh, it, it's, it's something that we should consider, definitely. I want to change the subject a little bit. Say hello to Michaela. I don't know, L. Douglas, I was in a Kennedy year way back in 1961, which is probably two generations before you were born. But I'm happy to see that the Peace Corps remains well. I was in Cameroon for three years. I extended for three years. I was having such a good time. But well, well, okay. Does anyone have anything to add? Otherwise, maybe we'll wrap this up. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to be sure that Thank everyone you. that is sitting here, I just have to say this, being the chair of the League of Women Voters, if anyone is not registered, you get in touch with me right now <laughs> <laughs> to vote. So everybody make sure you register the vote to vote, and the next election is um, August 11th. August 17th. Nope. I've August already 17th. voted, Pat. Yay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and you can vote by um, mail or rather absentee. You may, you may vote by absentee. If anybody needs any help with any of that, please give us a call. We'll be there for you. We want everybody to vote. <laughs> and do the census. Get everybody to do the census. Yeah, that's the other. Oh, important. yes. And the census. And the census if is you have very not done your do census. Online. I can't imagine anybody that I see on this group has not done the census yet, but it's so important. And so, and then I won't have to call you up because I signed up to help with going around to the census. So um, if you haven't filled it out yet, it takes like five minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank, yeah, thanks. Everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, thanks, thank everybody. You.